but I'd like to start by welcoming everybody to the school planning committee meeting of July 15th, 2020. Wow. Um, please note that in accordance with the emergency orders announced by Governor Charlie Baker to protect public health during the COVID-19 outbreak, this meeting will not be open to the public for physical attendance and committee members are joining this meeting via Zoom teleconferencing. The meeting is being live streamed and cable broadcast by ECAT. The meeting has been posted and the minutes will be available according to open meeting law requirements. Um, the public does have the ability to join our Zoom open meeting. Members of the public can also submit questions via the chat function on Zoom. These questions should pertain to topics on this evening's agenda and include your full name. Um, the chair, as we move through the agenda, if people have questions, um, the chair can acknowledge and respond to them. I'm not sure, it doesn't look like there are a lot of public participants. So if there's only one or two, I don't mind a raised hand and letting people ask their question out loud. So with that said, I'd like to quickly confirm what members of our meeting from the school planning committee voting members are here this evening because we will have to take some votes. Um, Dr. Cabral? Present. Ken Carlson? Present. Dottie Fulginetti? I thought I saw Dottie. Dottie Fulginetti? No. Um, Dave Field, although Dave's not a voting member. Patrick Helen. Caroline O'Neill. I'm here. Connor Reed. Billy Sobri. Jamie Stebbins. Present. Dave Twombly. Dave, I thought I saw you. I yep. know you're not voting, but you're here, right? Yep. Ann Weintraub. Here. Thanks, Ann. Jackie Wiseman. Here. And Jane Martin. So we do have enough here for um, agenda items that require a vote. Um, so we, we actually have something very special on the agenda tonight that I'm very excited about, and we're going to get to that in two minutes. But first, what I'd like to do is ask for a motion to approve the school planning committee minutes from June 17th, 2020. Could you say your name and whether it's the motion or a second? O'Neill, so moved to approve. Who's Carl, second? Second. Ken. Second, yes. Yeah, thank you, Ken. Um, all those in favor, I'm gonna go down in case other people have joined the meeting. So Cabral? Yes. Carlson? Yes. Fulginetti? Helen? Yes. O'Neill? Yes. Reed? Sobri? Yes. Stebbins. Stein. Weintraub. Yes. Wiseman. Yes. Martin. Yes. So with that, um, I'd like to um, turn this portion over to Leisha, who's going to give a little bit of background about the students that we've asked to join our meeting tonight and the presentation that they are going to give to us, which I hope you are all as excited about as I am because it's, it's, it's very impressive. So Dr. Cabral. Thank you very much. I, um, as we've been having continuing these meetings, even through the, the throughout the school closures, one uh, piece of information that kept coming up with the efforts on the part of the project manager as well as the designers to make green uh, 
thinking and sustainability and um, really um, being conscious, environmentally conscious with the, the new building, a lot of their designs incorporate those things. Well, at, can't remember which meeting we were at, but they had forwarded some information about some of their sustainability ideas that they were uh, either have already incorporated or were going to incorporate. And we have an extremely active science department. Um, the the co-department um, chairs, Nancy Donahue and Maria Annunziato are fantastic and very proactive. And we also have several very environmentally conscious uh, classes, courses, and activity groups, um, clubs for our students. And as you well know, on the school committee, we've had several presentations by students in terms of um, creating compost areas of the schools. Um, we've talked about greenhouses and, and et cetera. So knowing that background, I thought that perhaps the the two department chairs might be interested in, in hearing about some of these sustainability features, but also maybe have the opportunity to, to pitch in. Well, I contacted Dawn, the, the lead architect, who was extremely gracious about that. In fact, I feel like she was very excited about the idea and thought it would be great to invite the teachers and their students. So I reached out to the two chairs. They immediately, um, as usual, uh, were immediately very invested and interested. And they were the ones um, who pulled together a small group of students that you're gonna see here today. So that's a background of kind of how we get to this point and in, in, in terms of who the students are. Um, their instructor, the department chair is, is here tonight. Um, Nancy Donahue, and I thank her very much for her efforts in this. But as far as the presentation itself, we really just asked the students. First, we had a meeting with Dawn, and she kind of explained some of the features of the building right now and reviewed those sustainability items. Then Mrs. Donahue and myself met with the students on the side and we talked about some ideas we were just kind of throwing around between us um, and the girls were just biting like crazy. Um, all happened to be females in this group. Um, and they were, they were taking the ideas and you could see the gears going and they were already, before we got off the call, contributing and saying, well, what if we did this and how about that? So we uh, asked them to put together a presentation um, and that's what you're seeing now. We did meet with the designers again and they presented it to them and I saw the gears shifting <laughs> between from the students to Dawn who I don't even think could write fast enough to write down a lot of the things they were saying and again before we got off that call she had already assured them there were a lot of things that could be incorporated into the new building so it did happen rather quickly it definitely was a group effort for all the from all the great people that are that are here this evening and I thank you for those efforts and just immediately after seeing the presentation knew that the school planning committee wouldn't just want a recommendation, they would want to see this presentation. And so that's why we thought to ask them to come here this evening, which they've done. And I honestly don't want to say one thing about it, including I'll even let them introduce themselves because I think that you're going to see very quickly, these are, um, these are going to make you very proud of the Eastern Public Schools and, and proud of the students that, um, that attend, but also the instructors that work with them so hard um, day in and day out, because you can see, you'll be able to see their uh, background knowledge, their curiosity, their engagement, their articulation are phenomenal. And so without further ado, I have shared some co-host responsibilities with recent graduate, Olivia Pierce. And so I'm gonna ask Olivia if she will please take it from there. Sorry, I had to find the unmute button when I was hosting and sharing my screen. Um, so I'm going to introduce myself. My name is Olivia Pierce. A lot of you know me. I've been to um, a lot of different presentations at the school committee meetings. Um, but I'm going to actually pass the mic off to Haley Chan, who is going to present the first couple slides that we have. 
Hi everyone, today we are presenting a compilation of our ideas for the Blanche Ames Elementary School. From art opportunities to the sensory garden, each of these projects would help students make connections to Mrs. Ames and further learn about different STEM type work and sustainable aspects of our school. We tried to create projects that could act as community work for art students or members of the Environmental Society and hope to make each idea as interactive as possible to capture the attention of these younger students. Okay, so um, we're going to start off by talking about the hallways. Um, when Dr. Cabral gave us a tour of the hallways and footprint designs for each grade, a few of us had some ideas for instance changing the stars into astronaut feet and using a purple color scheme instead of the orange that some teachers were hesitant about. We also thought that there could be deer or bear tracks um, instead of the acorn, so it follows the whole footprint concept and borderland theme. And lastly, as an art opportunity, I'm sure we could make it a community project and enlist some students in the art club who would love to contribute with some sort of painted ceiling project that could further exhibit the theme for each grade. For example, the um, outer space ceiling in the second grade hallway pod area. Hi, my name is Emma Lawson and I'm going into senior year. Uh, so on the floor to ceiling planters in the cafeteria behind the ramp, uh, we are suggesting growing orchids. Uh, this actually relates to Blanche Ames, the namesake of the school, as she often drew orchids in her botanicals. They would be in enclosed or raised platforms with glass or mesh encasing so students cannot touch them. And there would be different colored orchids matching the color scheme of the timeline graphics in the background. Um, for the Blanche Ames timeline, we thought the big ramp at the cafeteria would be a perfect way to display events in Blanche Ames' life and honor her in an area of the school that many will see. The timeline could be accommodating to both young students and adults with modern graphics and bright color schemes, along with the more classic black and white photographs we have of Mrs. Ames' life and accomplishments. The ramp floor could be more designed for kids who are still in the beginning stages of reading with easy to understand pictures and less complicated words, while the ramp wall has more of the informational pieces underneath flaps with black and white photographs and plaques that have more detailed descriptions of Mrs. Ames' work. And together, the information under flaps could line up with the corresponding dates so it would really seem like you're walking through her life. Um, continuing with the timeline, um, like we said, we thought it might be fun to um, make it a little bit interactive with flaps located lower on the wall so students could lift them and face prompting questions such as um, Blanche Ames invented the color charting system, what are some things that you might want to invent, or just have some additional photos underneath. Sorry, it wouldn't let me unmute. Um, so we really wanted to make this timeline as clear and concise as possible because um, we don't want a cluttered, busy um, timeline, especially because it's gonna be in that centerpiece of the ramp, which is why we wanted the ramp floor to have those modern, um, clean, minimalistic um, graphics. And then we're going to hide the busier um, historical photos underneath the flaps, providing a level of interactivity as well as um, making our design seem less cluttered. Um, and on this slide, we have um, a wide variety of examples of specific events in Blaine James's life that we think would be well suited to a timeline. Um, obviously these descriptions are a little more wordy than we would like for these kids who are just beginning reading, um, but we have a lot of events to choose from when we go and create this ramp. And a lot of these events would tie in very nicely to the flaps on the ramp wall with um, prompting questions as well as historical photos and more information for kids who are interested. Is 
Hayden, are you there? I don't know if she's having trouble on mute. There you are. Wait, are you still muted? No, she's not muted. Um, Aiden, along with the invitation is a number to call in. If you if you have a phone or a cell phone available to you, you can call in for your audio. It could be an issue with your microphone. While she's figuring that out, I can um, present her slide for her. So we- do you want to move on to my part so she can do her part? Oh yeah, that's a good idea. Okay. Okay, okay so hi, I'm Anna Gaylor. I'm going to be a senior. So we also had some ideas um, for the media center. Um, so one um, big thing that we had was um, going off of the timeline. Um, we were kind of on the tour from Dr. Cabral and we noticed that there was this maker space and we also knew from past um, things that Bland James was a really big um, inventor and did a lot of things with inventing. Um, so we thought that this was a great opportunity to kind of highlight some of um, Blanche's inventions and also with the timeline because the ramp kind of leads up to the media center and um, kind of goes up into where this room would be. We thought it was kind of like walking through her life and then seeing what um, happens on the other side. Um, and also like including on the makerspace some like maybe scale models and blueprints and um, still engaging and making it very interactive with students. So on the next slide, we just had some examples um, about of um, art and the type of blueprint things I was kind of thinking that we could do. Um, maybe some labels, almost like a museum, but just a little one wall and just tying everything back to um, Blanche Ames and um, this makerspace and kind of tying the name of the school all together with um, the students that are going to actually be in it. And I just drew up some kind of examples here, nothing too big, um, fairly simple words. Um, obviously, we would not use my wording, but just something to this extent um, and just really there to inspire kids and make them see what is possible. All right, so moving on to outside the school, um, we definitely know that definitely in the Eastern community and um, we know that there's kind of a sadness to leave these old three schools, um, even though we know that we're going to a bigger and better school um, for the town. So we thought that maybe there would be some way to pay homage to these prior three elementary schools. The idea we came up with was actually like a painted town map outside of the building. Um, we were thinking that this could also be used as a way to teach about history. We could highlight other locations in Easton like the library and Borderland and Governor Ames. We all know there's so much history in Easton um, and kind of just put three smaller stars where the old schools were on the map and then maybe one bigger star, bigger star um, to kind of just connect them all. So I kind of just <laughs> made this in Google Drawings and this may be the style of map that's a very old map and um, this more um, kind of modern look. But I was also thinking that maybe in the bigger star we could put um, some type of word like home, together, unity, Easton, and just kind of symbolize the fact that yes, we did all come from these um, smaller schools, but now we're here and we're in a better place. And this is Blanche Ames Elementary School. Aiden, is your audio working again? Because we can jump back to your section before moving on. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. All Let right, me jump perfect. back to your section. Thank you so much. Went too far. There we go. All right, here we are. So we have a few art ideas for the two cafeterias. And our first idea is a nature mosaic. So here we have a picture of a nature mosaic and we wanted it to be a scene of Borderland State Park. And from this picture here, we would want something brighter, more interactive, fun to look at, and possibly including um, animals that are native to Easton. And then we could include a scavenger hunt type or a look and find type search throughout the mosaic for kids to find different animals and different elements of the mosaic. And then this next art piece um, bears a little bit of historical explanation. 
So one of Blanche Ames's many inventions was a color charting system for her artwork. And she wanted to be able to accurately paint many different colors in nature. So she actually created this whole system that charts many different colors. And on the next slide, I'll show you the idea we have for an art connection there. So here is a picture of the Oliver Ames Art Club and a mural that they designed. And so obviously this is in the high school and this is more geared towards high schoolers, but you can see at the top what I've added is breaking apart the different colors within objects. So you can see sort of like Blanche Ames did all the different colors that are present in our everyday lives. And then for a, a natural connection, instead of that mural, we would have something where we would have plants and trees and animals from Easton, similar to the other mural, but you could have them spaced out and then you would break down the different colors inside them to sort of inspire kids to observe the colors around them in our world, like Blanche James did. All right, so we had a couple of different um, ideas for the courtyard, um, basically turning the courtyard into a garden space. So the first of those ideas, oh, my button isn't working in. Okay, so the first of those ideas is a fountain in the middle of this garden. Um, and the name of this fountain would be Pud's Puddle, which I'll get into the historical background behind this on the next slide. Um, but we wanted a water feature in the courtyard. Um, it would obviously be a raised stone fountain to prevent kids from falling in. And we wanted it made of those stones that are similar um, to those of the Ames Mansion in nearby Borderland, evoking that sense of architecture, um, an architecture that was actually designed by Blanche Ames. We thought that this was a great way to invo involve the industrial arts department at the high school. Um, they're very talented and we thought that this was another great opportunity to bring in the community and make this school a whole community project. So, um, Blanche James single-handedly engineered an intricate system of piping and controls to maintain the water levels in the ponds and pools of Borderland. Um, one of these ponds and pools that she was um, known for um, was the design of Pud's Pond. So that's where we got the name of Pud's Puddle because this was sort of inspired by her um, engineering um, Pud's Pond. Um, to pay homage to this, as well as to connect to the school's message of curiosity and STEM-based thinking, we wanted to have a part of the base of the fountain, the front um, of the base made of glass or plastic so that kids can see the pumps and machinery inside of the fountain and understand how it works. Um, we thought it would be great if the different parts could be colored differently so that a plaque on the side could simply describe the function of each part. Again, just getting kids to be curious and to think about how things work. This plaque on the side would also describe how Blanche engineered the dams and pumps in Borderland and how she learned architecture in order to design Borderland when she was unhappy with the architects that she had hired. And this would comment on the importance of continuous learning and trying new things. Blanche James was never formally trained in architecture or engineering, but she read a lot and she studied these things and she tried them. Um, and it was through that that she was able to discover more things about herself and make new inventions and become better at these, um, at these sorts of tasks. And we just thought that was an excellent lesson that kids could learn from um, and a mindset that we wanted to inspire. And now moving on to the rest of the garden. We are also proposing um, something called a sensory garden in the courtyard um, so students can engage all their senses uh, when interacting with nature, um, except for taste, because I don't think we can have kids going around and eating flowers. I'm not sure that's the best lesson to teach. Uh, there would be little expense associated with this project or infrastructure associated with this project, just regular or garden maintenance. For all of the plants, I made sure that they were smaller in size and could fit inside of the courtyard, so no large bushes or trees. Uh, so there would be main symbols. Um, uh, each plant would have a color-coded symbol denoting which senses kids can use to interact with the plants. Uh, this is done so that kids who can't read can still enjoy the garden. Uh, for sight, I have found so many plants that are both pretty and um, host plants for butterflies natives to Massachusetts. Uh, Queen's Anne's Lace is a host plant for the black swallowtail. Aster is a host plant for painted ladies, and milkweed is a host plant for the endangered monarch butterflies. 
All of these four plants are known for their unique and fragrant smell, um, lavender, lemon balm, mint, and rosemary. Uh, for touch, uh, we have three plants. Uh, lamb's ear is, um, as its name suggests, soft to the touch. Uh, Mimosa pudica is actually a really interesting plant because the leaves actually furl in when you touch it. Uh, it is safe for kids though, it's not like a Venus flytrap where their finger could get stuck inside of it. And mullein is regarded as one of the softest plants in the world. Uh, so for sound, we had a combination of plants and wind chimes and bells, so they can engage the sense of sound in the sensory garden. Uh, so there's a plant um, called uh, Love in a Mist, uh, which makes, uh, which actually produces fruits that rattle um, to engage the sense of sound. And we also propose having wind chimes, bells, and potentially other stationary instruments so kids can engage the sense of sound in the sensory garden as well. All right, so we know that that was a lot of ideas. So we wanted to provide um, a quick recap. We also understand that we don't wanna break the bank with these sorts of art, art ideas. And so we've divided our ideas up into ideas that we think would be built along with the school that we really wanna make sure are built in the infrastructure um, because they require certain things like plumbing or wall planning um, and ideas that we think are better suited for later down the road where we can engage community fundraising and also engage um, groups like the art club and the industrial arts department, um, making these things more community-based projects. So for the ideas that we built along with the school, we have the footprints in the halls, which were already in the plans. We just had the um, suggestions for different footprints. Um, the orchids along the floor to ceiling cafeteria planter. Again, the planter was in the designs, but the orchids would need to be planted along with the school being built so that they have time to grow and thrive. The timeline along the cafeteria ramp, um, we have a suggested designer and a local connection of someone who is based in Easton who designed, um, I don't know if any of you know, the timeline in Terminal C in um, Logan Airport that has all the Massachusetts inventions. Um, this um, man designed that and he's locally based, so we thought that was a good local business connection. Um, the nature mosaic in one of the cafeterias. We have two different cafeterias and we suggested two different um, art pieces, but we think that the mosaic needs to go in first because it relies on the wall and it would rely on hiring someone to make the mosaic. Um, the makerspace wall art with Blanche's inventions. We think that this is pretty easy and we'll go um, in with the makerspace when that is being built and then the painted map outside the school. Um, later down the road with community fundraising or, you know, right when we build the school, we're not, we're not picky. We, of course, would like these elements as soon as possible, um, would be the painted ceilings in the hallways that we suggest would be great to be painted by the art club, the sensory garden with the fountain, and then the paint swatch style mural in the other cafeteria. So thank you all so much for listening and for bearing with us with the technical glitches. It went a lot smoother the first time around. Um, we are open to any questions that any of you may have, and we thank you all for listening. Before anyone jumps in with any questions, I just wanna say that this, what you guys just did is effectively what I do as a living. This is the presentation style, the way you guys obviously had, had background information, your slideware, everything you do, it's, it's what I do all day, every day, from the incredibly small room you see behind me, and I would hire all of you at this point. <laughs> that was fantastic, incredibly, incredibly well done. Thank you so yeah. much. I'd like to second that. Excellent. Yeah, very, very is, nice presentation. This is Caroline O'Neill. Olivia, <clears throat> I am just so wowed by you every single time I encounter you. <laughs> and But what a great group you've put together. I mean, you guys are all brilliant. And I was actually just sitting here thinking that any corporate recruiter looking uh, at this presentation would be champing at the bit <laughs> to sign you up now <laughs> before you even go to college. But uh, this is just absolutely phenomenal. I need to do that. I, I can get paid if you guys get hired. So after this, if you guys have <laughs> any quick resume, we'll just, we'll just, we'll see what we can put together. It'd be great. So I just, I want to comment, um, and they've, they've heard this already from me. I think one of the things that we talked about and the reason that we wanted to have them come and present this evening is, is you know, for the last couple of meetings, we've kind of been um, into the mechanics of the project 
And we really thought, and given everything that has had happened for the last three months of school and where everybody is kind of um, with everything right now, we just thought this was a really exciting presentation. And um, PMA did point out to us that actually this detail of work is really something that would normally happen a little bit further down in design development when you're at you know, closer to 90%, but we didn't want to wait. We thought that this was just, the work that was done was, um, was really well thought through. They curated all of their information so carefully, and we just wanted to get this in front of you right now. So those are my, my two comments. And um, I don't know if Dawn wants to jump in, but pretty much we're, we're fairly confident that everything that they have suggested is doable and, and very doable and doable probably at the point when we're getting ready to open the building that we could have a lot of this done. Jane, if I wanted to let others speak, but um, I do have a few comments. When this was presented to us last week, uh, a couple of things happened. I recorded it and shared it with some of our consultants um, and also back to Alicia and Chrissy uh, just for their use and um, so that it was uh, documented. That was before I knew that they were gonna come present tonight. So I'm thankful that they would let us do that. So I was able to share it, for instance, with Ashley, who's on the call. She's our, uh, Ashley and Jackie are on our Traverse team. They're our landscape architects. Uh, as the girls were talking the first time, I'm writing notes frantically thinking, why didn't I invite them to join in? So I was glad it was um, uh, recorded. I just wanna say that for me, Patrick, first of all, you're not the first to offer them a job. I already did, <laughs> but no, seriously, they're fabulous. They, I was like a proud parent when they finished. I couldn't stop smiling that entire day. But some of the things that stuck out to me was how thoughtful and respectful they were of Blanche Ames and her work. Um, the amount of research that was done to put into this was um, above and beyond anything I expected. I appreciate how sensitive they are to the age of the students. That's something that's been really important in this project. And the fact that they were sensitive to that, recognizing color and that some students may not be reading yet and sort of um, keeping things clean for the sake of not being too distracted for some students. I, I really appreciate that. Also that they were focused on learning and anytime, whether it's the map and learning about Easton, whether it's the fountain and learning about how that works and color coding it, the level of detail was um, above and beyond. Also engaging the community, whether it's with the signage um, company that was suggested or student uh, art clubs or industrial arts students, all of that, I'm, I'm thankful that they were, um, that was on their mind. And then lastly, just as Patrick said, the style of presentation is, you know, I can't, I couldn't believe these were high schoolers in an Olivia's case about to go off to college. So um, we are able to incorporate quite a few of these uh, suggestions. And some of the things that we talked about uh, the other day was that we were gonna share it with Ashley, who we did, and she already commented, a lot of this is already put into the design or about to be. Um, as far as like the planting, she was going to cross-reference it with what she was suggesting as far as a sensory garden. We did talk about wanting to locate where the fountain would be so we could provide service to that, but to allow that to be a future industrial arts project. So the fountain itself wouldn't be there, but the infrastructure could be. Um, and that we were going to try and engage our Perkins Eastman graphics team to help with the design of the timeline and up to the makerspace and some of the signage there so that it, and Olivia, correct me if I'm wrong, I asked if you and or others would um, uh, want to stay involved. And I think you said yes last week. So if you're still willing, I would love for that to happen and it be a dialogue that um, these ladies can continue to contribute. And then Chrissy was going to talk to the parent group. Do I have that word right? The association, the parent, um, the PGA is what I wrote down about a possible fundraiser for Mosaic. So I'm not sure. Uh, PTA, parent teacher um, association. Oh, PTA. Why did I write G? I thought it was like a parent group. Um, different Must have been a nice made. day. You were thinking about golfing. <laughs> I wish. Um, so that's a possibility as far as um, raising the funds to do the two mosaics uh, in the cafeterias. I love the look and find idea. I love the, you know, the relationship to Borderland. So 
um, that was kind of where we left it. So long as everyone on this group was okay with the implementation of, of the ideas, that's, we feel as though a lot of these can be put into the project without major um, cost implications. Uh, probably the biggest ones would be the infrastructure for the fountain, depending on where that lands in the courtyard. Um, so I don't know if Ashley has any thoughts on that or wants to say anything. Only that I was so excited <laughs> when I heard this presentation. I was thrilled. I emailed Don right away. I was like, oh my God. Yes, <laughs> same. <laughs> so great. I think the level of thinking is just amazing. And a lot of these elements we are actually also implementing already like the sensory garden, but I think taking those layers of the signage for the plant material and the different sensory types, we will certainly incorporate. Uh, I think we have some great ideas for where that map can go too. So we will be in touch and start circulating these ideas and get them into the design, but we're really, really excited about it. So, and I just wanna add one last thing. I, I gushed about this already and gave a lot of feedback in terms of the content and so forth, but the teacher in me can't let the opportunity go by to just point out even to the adults here, older adults and younger adults, we have all adults here, but um, to just point out to you the level of teamwork and cooperation that really happened seamlessly on this. And um, to the point of really pr uh, problem solving together on the fly, which I have to tell you, especially Actually, with the technology, I've seen a lot of superintendents and, and CEOs snap and kind of go haywire for less than what happened here. And you just seamlessly like your professional presenters. So good job again. But I had to really point out those very, <laughs> very important life skills and that you um, exhibited that well, exhibited that well. So thank you again. Great, so the only action item that we have before we move on is um, that Dawn and um, Ashley, I imagine is going to stay connected in with the, the, the group and continue to move things forward. And as you need, if or as you need to bring things back to school planning, please do that. Um, I know that we'll see a lot of this um, show up when we get to probably 90% DD, but so we're good. Yes, we will stay in touch and through Leisha's office, we will set up right. a follow up um, to okay. continue this dialogue. Thank you. So girls, you are welcome to stay for the rest of the meeting um, or you're welcome to, to get on with whatever you need to get on to tonight. Thank, but thanks so much for giving your time and being willing to um, come and make your presentation to this full group. Much appreciated. Thank you so much for Thank having, you for having us. us. Thank you. I second that, ladies. Great job. Yeah. <laughs> Thank Thank you. Have a good night. Night. Thank you. And Don, don't be greedy. Share their resumes with us. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I got them. I literally, that was the first word out of my mouth, too. It was, all right, do you guys need a job? <laughs> <sighs> okay. So, um, I am now going to do what I always do, which is turn the next piece of the meeting over to um, PMA and Perkins Eastman so that they can walk us through all the focus group updates um, and um, work with us on any decisions or votes that we need to take tonight. So with that, Walter, you're up. Perfect. I am actually going to pass it very quickly over to Perkins Eastman to go over the focus group updates. Um, so Dan, Don, Sarah, Ashley, and Jackie, just let me know when you need me to change a slide. So we um, we wanted, Ashley asked if she could go first. So can we zip forward to the playground surfacing plot slides? Because I think that was something that was requested. I, I'm, okay, I'm okay going out of order. Thanks, if Dan. Else I appreciate it. <laughs> Not um, a problem. Uh, I only have one slide, so let me make sure I get great. to it. So, Ashley, I didn't, this was all I had for it. Um, did you want me to pull up the email that I sent out to the committee um, with all of that? Do you actually mind if Jackie shares her screen? Is that okay? Uh, Jane or Alicia, could you make that capability? Up to Jane and I can make it happen if that's what she wants to do.
Ashley, whose screen? Yeah, is it? Uh, it will be Jackie Reesings. Yeah, got it. So um, we actually had two really good user group meetings. Um, we had a bike path meeting, which went very well. Um, so what we looked at the bike path is we know we have this existing multi-use path that crosses through the campus. So we wanted to make sure what the goal was and the intent for the new alignment and if that wanted to stay, if that wanted to go. Um, based on our understanding, that's a heavily used bike path. So that will just be recreated in kind um, in a very similar alignment as it is today. Um, the pathway will be reduced by two feet. It's currently 10 feet. Um, and we did talk to the planning department about the possibility of reducing that to eight. Um, it will have three foot grass strips on either side. Um, and part of the reason for that is the multi-use fields uh, next to it did get larger. So that reduces the available area, but also we do have many more sidewalks on either side of the roadway. Um, so they were uh, acceptable and open to that change too, but the bike path or the multi-use path, I should say, is in a similar orientation as it is today. The next big discussion we had was the play surfacing options for um, the school. So what we first did was go through the different requirements that play surfacing needs to meet in Massachusetts. And Massachusetts is actually quite strict. So there's two things that are required. It needs to meet fall attenuation standards, and then it also needs to meet Massachusetts accessibility guidelines. So there's a number of different surfacing options for us, ranging from port in place to play turf to asphalt or grass. The only three that will meet both of those requirements are port in place, play turf, or rubber mats. So that's where we started, and that's where we started developing um, and going into those different options. So Jackie, if you don't mind switching to the next slide. So port in place surfacing is, our, um, is the first option we reviewed. Uh, some of the pros of this, it's aesthetically pleasing, meets all ADA requirements. Um, it's one big monolithic surface, so it eliminates a lot of maintenance. Um, some of the cons to this are, you know, it's more costly than the other place surfacing, and we do find that it can get hot um, sometimes. So we do find that color selection on this place surfacing is really important. And then in the playground areas, we've actually strategically located trees too, so that we can get some sort of canopy coverage on that as well. There is um, also has been some concern brought up about recycled rubber use in uh, many of these play surfacings. So I just wanna point out that in this specific play surfacing, it's combined of two different uh, profiles. You have a recycled rubber mat underneath, and then on the top, you have an EPDM layer, which is virgin rubber. So any recycled rubber is fully encapsulated and it's not available to be uh, touched or accessed by anyone using the playground, which is actually um, like the opposite. They actually do have some rubber systems, not ADA accessible where it's, it's loose rubber and it is recycled. So the next option we looked at was play turf. Again, meets fall attenuation and um, it also meets ADA accessibility guidelines. Not to be confused with um, an artificial turf field where you have the rubber infill particles. It does not have that. However, um, one of the cons to the system is A, that the turf mats can break up and pull apart. So some maintenance associated with that with really heavy use. Um, but they're all, there's also PFAS found in some of the synthetic fibers and also the mat. So obviously that can provide toxicity and um, contamination to drowned water. So that's some, there's a consideration there. Uh, the next option is rubber mats. So there's two kinds of rubber mats. There's this perforated rubber mat that you're looking um, at up top. Um, and this system was really developed uh, to take wood fiber bark march fields and make them ADA accessible. So we think this is a fantastic solution for an existing playground uh, that needs to be brought up to compliance. However, it's not the best solution for a new playground. Uh, the rubber mats, basically you'd have a wood fiber bark underneath, then you have the rubber mat on top and more wood fiber over that. And then those rubber mats you see, though they say they're one continuous layer, they're actually hooked together with zip ties. So though they really work, and I think it's a great option for communities who need to retrofit a playground, I'm not sure it's the best solution here. Solid rubber mats, also another option. Uh, these are recycled rubber mats fully installed over a hard base. Some of the concerns here, I mean, the, the pros would be, you know, colorful, can be attractive. 
I think some of the concerns are maintenance, like what if these mats actually come apart, and in which case you actually do have a safety concern with someone falling because these playgrounds are getting more and more fun and thus higher and higher and higher. So we do need to be very concerned about that. So maintenance is an issue on that. So our next um, piece of this was some of the questions that came up from the play surfacing. Jackie, is there any way you could zoom into that slightly? Thank you. So these are some of the questions that came up and we wanted to just directly answer them. So the first one, are children physically in contact with recycled rubber on a port in place system? No, um, there would be one and a half inches of the EPGM or virgin layer of rubber above it. So any recycled rubber is encapsulated. Um, so for someone to actually have access to it, there would have to be damage to the product, in which case it, you also have a fall attenuation issue there too. So that's a maintenance issue. Um, another question, is there silica sand in any of the port in place surfacing? The answer is no, there is not. The third question, are there PFAS present in port in place surfacing? So this is really more related to the play turf than it is the play surfacing, because as we mentioned, um, PFAS can be and are found in the filaments and uh, the mats. So it's not as applicable to port in place. However, PFAS cover a broad range of uh, chemicals and it's a very large grouping. So what we started getting into here was you know, environmental concerns and what we think the best approach is, though the PFAS aren't as present in the port in place surfacing, there could be chemicals and it's really hard with thousands of these out there. I mean, they're everywhere in our environment today um, to say, no, they're not. But um, what we would do is start tightening up our specifications because our spec will go out to three manufacturers. So I think it's important at this point uh, they, we, we have to request a letter from the manufacturer and certified third-party testing that would say that heavy metals, chemicals, and PFAS are below safe harbor levels as identified in California's Proposition 65. So Proposition 65 has a full list of toxic chemicals that gets updated yearly. And so that's probably one of the strictest lists out there right now. At the same time, as you start reading through some of the research and concerns and some of these other play surfacing discussions that are happening around the country, uh, heavy metals does get brought up a lot. Uh, there is reference to lead in some of the concerns. So at the same time, we would also require the manufacturer to submit a lead and heavy metal letter outlining that in the port and place surfacing, in the material, uh, they're in compliance with any 2011 standards and that they meet, there's no lead or there's such a minimal amount uh, that it falls underneath the requirements and the same for heavy metals. Um, so if we were um, moving in the direction of the port in place surfacing, we would implement uh, these requirements to be included in our construction package. So uh, the next question was, is there any substitute for the SBR layer of the port in place surfacing? And I think what we were looking for here was, is there an alternative to recycled rubber in any of these options? We did call numerous manufacturers and know at this point in time, there's no other substitution for that layer because it would not, again, meet those fall attenuation standards it needed to. Um, and then we had another question, are mats require under slides and swings? And if so, what are they made of? Um, if it would be a fiber bark mulch uh, system, which is not acceptable or ADA accessible in Massachusetts, you would need mats underneath those swing sets or slides or any high impact areas. You can incorporate them in a port in place system, but it is not necessary and generally not done unless it's like a very urban environment. And then the finally, the last question we had was how is the system repaired? And Jackie, if you just scroll down a little bit, we have pictures here. So if there ever was damage to a port in place surface, basically what they would do, they would cut in, come in, cut out the damaged or settled area, they would recompact the base and then they would pour a patch on the top. And this is some imagery of how they do this. So the maintenance on these playgrounds are limited and usually some of the issues that happen, happen when they're installed due to inadequate uh, preparation of the base. Um, but they are fixable. If there are issues, they can be fixed, which is important. So is there any questions there that I can answer? So Ashley, I just, I want to jump in and make it clear to the school planning committee that this is all of the information that the playground subgroup 
discussed. Mm -hmm. And that after the discussions of the playground subgroup, it, it, the reason that, that Ashley kept on focusing on the port in place system in her Q and A's is really the direction of the playground subgroup was to make a re recommendation um, to the school planning committee that our playground surfaces would be the port in place um, rubber mat system that we did we really weren't interested in going with the um, turf the the turf option and obviously the last options that you described um, were more applicable to playground that, right exactly so um, we just you know, we asked Ashley to bring all the information to the to the school planning committee, but really the um, the direction that the subgroup or the focus group was leaning towards was the port in place um, surfacing. So I think with that, if any members of the school planning committee have questions or comments or concerns, um, I'm happy to open it up. And I also have to apologize after the last meeting, um, we had information we were trying to get out there and it got stuck in a Google document black hole. So that information is now available via PDF and Walter has it and will um, send that out to everybody to review. It's distributed you know, today. Yep, distributed today. Connecticut had, this issue is coming up in many, many different communities and states. So there's a lot of research out there and we encourage everyone to read and look at as much as possible, but uh, there are just some pieces there that we have found and thought were applicable. Um, Jane? Jane? Go ahead, Caroline, go ahead. Oh, hi. Um, I was just wondering, can you send us that list of questions with the answers? Can can that be uh, emailed to all of us? I think, wasn't this document emailed? Oh, was that? Well, you know, I saw the document. I didn't see that, but oh, maybe, maybe I missed it. No. Carolyn, you're right. The questions and answers are new. That's from today. So okay. we will send that out to the group. Great. Okay, Thank great. You. Thank you. You're welcome. The other I had was on the repair side, which is it, it sort of touches on two points, which is there there's going to be in this case, high impact is where the, the possibility of a child impacting the ground heavily is is high impact, or is it where there's a potential for I don't know how well this wears away, essentially, like underneath the slide, for instance, or something like that. Is it, is it something where there's a maintenance aspect that after three years, five years, there's a section that would need to be cut and replaced? Or is it is it heavy duty enough that it's only when you have some sort of breakage in that, that scenario? Mm -hmm. um, generally, it's heavy duty enough. It's only where you have a breakage or issue like that, I think. Um, the reason I asked and started talking about the mats under slides or, and we're, we talked specifically about slides or swings, it's just anywhere a kid would consistently be hitting their uh, feet up against uh, that area um, that could potentially cause a divot. So I did have a conversation with the, one of the surfacing manufacturers today and said, you know, how realistic is this? Is this usually done anymore? And she said, no, generally we're not seeing or having to apply mats um, underneath these areas um, because the play surfacing has gotten so much better so you don't see as many issues um, unless it was again an installation issue and we do have playgrounds that have been in for 10 years and we've evaluated them and had you know not had those problems if you did want to reinforce it more uh, the way it would work is you would it's like almost a foam pad uh, with rubber on the top and that gets installed flush with the rest of the play surfacing um, and that would be right underneath those slides or swings. So that is an option available. Um, and I think mostly where that happens, very urban areas, Boston parks, um, places like that. Awesome, thank you. What is the life expectancy? Um, usually we see playgrounds lasting 10 to 15 years around there. I think it'll, a lot of it depends on use and the maintenance of the playgrounds. And I would note that this play surfacing is installed right next door or at Richardson Olmstead too. And I think, I don't know if anyone knows better, but has that been in for 10 years now? Or around there? Or we could find that out. Dave, do you know, Dave Twombly, do you know how long that's been there? I feel like Corinne mentioned that it was recent. It's a fairly newer. Mm -hmm. I feel like Corinne in one of our meetings mentioned it was not original to RO. 
I was just, just trying to uh, remember. I could I could remember somebody saying that, and you're right, it was Corinne. Uh, she did say it was put in a few years after Aro, which was it's like 21 years old. So even if it's 15, maybe. Yeah. Any other questions, comments? So in general, is the school planning committee? Um, I don't think we need to have a vote on this, but the direction that we're giving the design team is to continue moving forward with the design um, using the port in place surfacing. I, I think that's right, Jane. Okay. Uh, I, I don't really see a, a better alternative. I mean, some of the concerns we had um, aren't really addressed consistent with the regulations that Massachusetts has. So, you know, there, there might be other options in, in areas that don't have the same quite strict requirements that Massachusetts has for the attenuation and the accessibility. Right. But it seems like this is really the only sensible option. And, and I think it's wise that I know that um, Ashley had talked about in our meeting that some some playgrounds will incorporate the play turf as part of the structure, but I think we just I think we want to stay away from the play mm -hmm. turf. I think given the possibility of PFAS, I think we just want to stay far away from that. Um, I agree. Right now, okay, okay. And as I mentioned, we can't start we can start tightening up our submittals too and require some of this uh, testing and certification from the manufacturer that is selected as well. So. Yeah. Um, I think that's going to really eliminate these issues of heavy metals or, or lead in the future too. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay. Um, All right, I'll jump, oh, I'll jump back see. to the presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Walter. Dan, go ahead with the security or Don. Sure. No, I can do this. Um, we uh, we did have a re-meet about the security with everybody. Um, and that really was a re-meet. I mean, we had decided that we should come back and kind of touch base with all the things that we had talked about at the previous security meeting. Um, there was a little bit, there were a few more questions about the lockdown procedures. And I think we're maybe still waiting on a couple of pieces of little information about that. Um, there was a big discussion about visibility and from the main entry vestibule and how um, it, there's a real desire to be able to see from the office out into the parking areas. And uh, we were able to accommodate that. We moved everything from that was on that wall over to the wall that's uh, adjacent the gym um, when discussions with the uh, fire department because there's some equipment there that they need to access when they enter the building in an emergency. Um, they were amenable to moving that based on this request. So we are going to make that that glazing larger so that, that this can be accommodated and people will be, you will be able to see out into the parking lot and monitor that from that location. And then um, there's a meeting being set up with Synergy, who's your security consultant. And we will um, go over the new procedures and do one last pass here and make sure that we have everything covered and everything is the way that, that we're all in agreement at how it's gonna work. So if there's any questions about that meeting. All right. Moving on. Talked about that. Yeah. I'll leave so this to for, on. Yeah, I'll take this. Uh, the interiors working group, we had a follow-up meeting. Our last meeting I think was in January or February. So a few months ago. Uh, what we talked about here, the highlights, there's a whole presentation and I, um, shared it with Walter. I'm not sure if it's already been shared. If it hasn't, he's going to share it after this meeting tonight. So there are some visuals that might be helpful as far as 3Ds and where um, 
colors and themes may happen, but it, it just seemed like a little much to share tonight with the student uh, presentation. So take a look at that. We talked about um, locker heights and we talked about uh, cafeteria one versus cafeteria two and um, some of the finishes in there. We talked about floor patterns. We talked about theme patterns, uh, water jet cutting some of the footprints, which the students alluded to. Um, and they had suggestions on that, i.e., you know, replacing the acorn with uh, animal prints. So we're already um, starting to implement their ideas. Uh, we had, um, yeah, so the Blanche Ames signature design, I know that the orchids and some of her um, inventions are, will make its way via the presentation you saw earlier. So this all happened before that presentation. So um, some of what they were suggesting is in a reaction to this meeting. Uh, I also presented the media center finishes that I presented at our last meeting a month ago. Um, so those changes are already underway and moving forward and then the student group suggestions. So that was a follow-up to this meeting and now you've seen where that's gone. So a lot's happened in the last few weeks on this. So as Don said, I will forward that presentation to the school. I think most of the attendees who are on the interiors uh, email got the presentation, but I, uh, I'll forward that to this group with the questions from Ashley's uh, presentation earlier tonight, um, either tomorrow morning or as soon as I get uh, the PDF of her questions. Perfect. Thanks, Walter. Yep. The one, the, I'm sorry. I'm just oh, going to sorry. Go yeah, sorry. go ahead. Just very quickly, in terms of the, I know that the mural that the students talked about in terms of the mural, not the mural, but the painting outside the building with the stars that indicates the three other schools that would feed into the big star. It just occurred to me now that, that and I just don't want to forget is that, you know, there have been other elementary schools in Easton historically, besides just Center and Parkview and Moreau. So we might want to think about, you know, if we're really looking holistically at the historical perspective in terms of, you know, the history of our elementary schools, we might want to be thinking about um, making sure that we somehow feed all of that in. Um, because I do know we had quite a conversation about what pieces of history from the three primary schools might we want to retain? And I'm fairly certain we all wanted to step back and say we wanted to focus on the entire history of elementary schools in Easton. So I don't know, Don, if you just want to make a note of that as things are moving forward. Thank you. Yep. So I'll take note of that and we'll research that in collaboration with you guys and make sure that that's implemented. Thank you for that. Okay, we also had a, um, a focus group that was just around the current pandemic and really just to kind of brainstorm ideas. And we've been doing this with all of our clients just to, you know, kind of feel, feel out what, how we're going to return to school, what school might look like and, you know, what decision, what things we may want to change or what we might want to think about as this, for this current pandemic and the future. Um, some of the things that came out of that meeting were uh, to add a flammable camp cabinet for hand sanitizer storage, because I think we're going to have a lot more hand sanitizer in the building. That was a fire department request. And there was a uh, review of people management, um, looking at the times of occupancy and talking about re uh, re the floor decaling, which used to, I think you're probably all seeing as you're venturing out. There's a lot of floor decals going on. We talked about those things being really removable because you know we don't know the the length and duration of this and what happens next and that a lot of these decals should really the things shouldn't be permanent in our buildings they should be something that's fluid and able to be moved or removed depending on how things go but it was something that we did talk about having um we talked about adding wiring in, vest in the vestibules for future temperature sensors that might be employed and uh, there's a lot of talk about this right now about having kind of checkpoints and when entrances to buildings um, for businesses it, it's happening quite a bit um, that not so much for schools Pam has spoken to me against this because she feels that this is not something we should be doing um, we feel that you know adding the infrastructure for this if that technology becomes something we can rely on more is not is a very low cost and allows you the flexibility to do that if you so choose in the future. So we talked about adding wiring for those things in the future. 
um, wiring uh, certain places for future teaching spaces. Um, right now, we wouldn't really consider certain spaces for to be like primary teaching spaces, but with the return to school and the social distancing requirements, there may be a need for some of our larger spaces to kind of double up as teaching areas. And there was a talk, there was a lot of discussion about how not only can we accommodate classrooms to to do to do distance learning if we need to say there's only half the class or even less in the classroom, could we send that out into the into the uh, to other kids as a distance learning component? But does it make sense? And I think we agreed it made sense to wire up some of these very large spaces like the gym and the cafeterias in order to use those as future teaching spaces if so needed. Uh, we talked. To, uh, we also talked about touch-free, as much touch-free as we could. Um, that includes uh, how do you get in and out of the building, um, drinking fountains. Everybody was very much in favor of all bottle filling drinking stations. And we did do some research and found out that that is acceptable to do. So we will be going ahead and not, not providing you know, very, very limited drinking fountains as the old school type that you would see. Um, but also how you could get in and out of this building with, with a very limited touching, like not touching the door handles because you know, of course in the morning when kids are coming in and parents are coming in or whoever's coming in in the morning, you have hundreds of people touching the doors and that's, it's gonna be impossible to manage that. And there were, we were discussed ways that we might be able to lessen or reduce that, that issue. Um, basically with talking about door hold open devices at these entrances so that those doors, when the kids are coming in are open and they're locked open so that, because they are manned and they are being, there are people watching them. And if you are manning that and monitoring that, then there's no reason for that door not to be propped open. So no one has to touch that door handle and the kids can just filter right into the building. And then there's another, um, there's an article that has been circulated in our office and out there, and I, I won't go into the, to it, um, but it talks about uh, bathrooms and how bathrooms are, are bad for this and spread of these, this particular virus and possibly others. And we, we discussed higher, we discussed making the stalls higher in order to contain anything that, any flushing that might happen in the toilets. And there's a, there's a whole article you probably don't want to read during lunch or any time you're going to have any kind of meal that talks about this in length. Um, but that was something we also talked about doing and executing and putting into the project was just increasing the heights of the stalls and trying to block any kind of anything moving from stall to stall or throughout the rooms. Um, there's another one that's missing off here that we also talked about was um, breaking off the nurse's suite and having its own dedicated mechanical so that it has its own exhaust and, and supply. So it's not the, any air that's filtration that's filtered or that's being provided to that nurse's suite is actually separate from any other area in the building. So if there is a, someone who is ill and ends up at the nurse's office, then that air is not just pumped back into the entire administration suite. It's actually contained in that one small area. And I think that is something we are going to do. That's something we all, we feel is, is something we should, be pursuing and we're going to, going to Dan, have its own dedicated system. Dan, can I add to that while you're talking about May. that? We, we spoke with, um, and I remember Anne commenting on it, um, that in a, a possible isolation room, instead of adding, because the MSBA won't necessarily fund any added space, right, mm -hmm. to use the adjacent spare office in that administrative suite that we currently have, it's um, basically through a door and just a little ways up the hallway, uh, not very far if an isolation space was still needed at that time or for any future reason, uh, might be worth adding that possibly to that separate mechanical system. Dan. Yeah, that's fine. Yep, that's fine. It may yeah. actually want to have its own exhaust. Or that, yeah. Jane, I, I just, on the bathroom yeah. issue, I, 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 I've sort of a, appointed myself a somewhat of an expert on this whole bathroom issue. There are many very pleasant articles uh, out there mm -hmm. about this, but I think we mentioned this at a previous meeting. One of the things that seems really important is to have toilet lids because I know that you're talking about barriers, but the issue is a plume 
goes up when the toilet is flushed. And so that and that plume can remain in the air for uh, about eight to 14 minutes. Yep. Um, so toilet lids though, I, I mean, you'd have to teach children to close the lids. I actually am of the opinion that they will if you make a game out of it and you, you know, encourage them. I have a lot of confidence in young kids in that way. Not everybody does, but um, it, even if they only close the lids some of the time, that would significantly reduce potential for aerosol for a non-symptomatic child that happens to be using the bathroom. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. And that is, um, you're absolutely right. That is one of the, the uh, things that people talk about as being one of the really important things, closing the lid of, yeah. the, um, of the toilet. And I did do some, a little bit of research on automatic closing lids to see if that yeah. such thing existed. And they're either very, very expensive, right? Um, yeah, and which I thought was something we really weren't going to be interested in doing, and um, and or like very uh, complicated, right? They're uh, very so, expensive and they break down a lot. Yep. Yeah. So I I think that um, I think this is a good way to go. I think we should do lids, and then I think there is that we we just need to train. I think you're right. Yeah. Kids love stuff like that if you, you know, have the right approach. <laughs> yep. So, um, so are you going to move forward and um, start including these options in the designs? Yes. And what's the, you know, my question, cost impact of all of this? I mean, is it doable within the project budget? Um, the only thing I think we're going to need to come back and talk about after the uh, after the estimate set is probably going to be the the distance learning aspects. And I my inclination was to price a single room for this because we do know what that technology is, and then have and see where we're at budget wise, and come back and talk about how many rooms we want to do or can afford to do after we because I think I think we're going to need these, and I think we'll need them in the future. Even if you know, no matter what happens, that we're gonna we're gonna want to have a certain number of rooms in these buildings able to be distance learning, and I just don't know at the moment how many we can afford. But my gut tells me the way to do it is to is to price a single room and see what that is, and then you know we'll have a number at in hand. The other items are are you know, we're gonna we would do for the toilet we would do um we would do we wouldn't do lids but we would do seats. So adding the lid is negligible, it's not really a cost at all. The wiring is really not a, really a cost at all. Bringing a, bringing a, a, you know, a cable over to those vestibules is nothing. Okay. So, and the higher stalls is really an, an not really a, I mean, those, those are only large costs when we don't do them now. Okay. Dan, what, what about, uh, I would think that possibly the additional infrastructure for the nurse's office may have some may have some cost impact potentially, it, but maybe. It's very little because we're, we were already going to have mechanical service in those spaces anyway. Yeah. So we're really only talking about splitting that off and having an extra unit. So the bigger, the unit that was serving the nurses, the admin was X CFM. Now it's a little less. Yep. And then there's another unit that's gonna be, so it, it wasn't, it's not a huge cost. And then what does distance learning in a classroom entail in, in Perkins' mind, or in I have a whole write-up on that. I'm I'm happy to share with everybody what that means or what we think yeah. that means. I mean, yeah, there would right now there would be what we would anticipate is there would have to be a camera, and there would have to be multiple cameras in the ceiling. One would be pointed at the teaching wall or or multiple teaching walls, and the other one would be pointed back towards the students. There would be um, you know additional microphones because they have to pick up they have to pick up voice in the classrooms. And yeah. then there's a whole, um, how do you interface? How does the teacher interface with the, with the kids who are at home? So something, I think part of the meeting that we had, um, and, and Chad, feel free to jump in here, uh, part of the discussion, and maybe it was kind of glossed over at the end of that meeting, but we may, you know, this building is three plus years from opening from at this mm -hmm. point in time. Um, so. I think we as a group don't really know what the future holds. Obviously, this is an important discussion to have, um, but would 
maybe the dis the difference between making those classrooms uh, virtual ready as opposed to virtual classroom capable um, would there be a significant savings cost difference in between those two I would I would think there would be if you're not buying all the infrastructure yeah I, I think you would end up buying you what you want to do is lay out the room so that you have the technology the you know the power and data power probably not really much needed but the data in the locations that you would need to be able to be connecting these these elements and that's what I think we want to own right now those particular pieces and the pieces of equipment those are going to in the next three years that's going to change dramatically yeah. so i but i think the idea of having a camera on the back of the room that's pointed towards a, the classroom wall or one in the center that's pointed towards that can be rotated and pointed towards any teaching wall that data port is probably not going to change so that's but i'm happy to share that with everybody the what or we have a consultant who's worked with us on this or who is working currently on this um and really universities and are, are the ones who are leading this because they are all going to be primarily teaching like this coming up the next the next semester and they're all outfitting and reworking their their rooms to do this yep so and then i think the last piece of this would be at this point in time the 60 percent cds that are with the estimators do not currently contain any of those no. Okay. I, um, so I just wanted everyone to be aware of that when we get these estimates, um, that this yeah. is something that's going to be looked at during the next phase of design and ongoing. And um, I don't know that we'll be able to get a number on it during this estimate. What do you, what do you, Chad and Dan, what do you guys think? I think we could. I, I think what I would do is probably just diagram this in a, out of one of the classrooms. And that's what I was anticipating doing is sending this off as an alternate. And you know, per classroom. room cost and saying like, what is it at? What's the ad okay. per room? For this? Okay. To do I think this. that's something we could definitely get in the estimates then obviously, yep. and we can review with this committee when that um, value management exercise happens. Um, so, yep. Yep. so I want to clarify in the estimates for 60%, is that what you're saying? Or in the estimates yes. for 90? Nine. No, we'll do it at the 60, right. 60. But, okay. but it's not going to be in the estimates. It will be part of the value management discussion. Got it. Got it. It'll be an ad an, an ad alternate for you to, to okay. make a decision. Yep. Yep. Has there been any guidance from school building authority on how to deal with this issue? Because we're kind of on the you know, on a fence where things are changing rapidly. And I think we all know that learning is going to change. Mm -hmm. um, and is has there been anything at all out of the state um, that they may find this these accommodations that we're looking at now um, eligible or is there any funding mechanism that the state may be considering for the number of you know for at least the schools that are under design right now that can incorporate these things and because they're going to have to do something for schools that are, you know are not designing anything older schools schools that are already constructed that may have to um you know retool the systems to do this. So Don, oh. jump in here if I'm, if I'm wrong about this, um, what or if I misspeak. What I understand right now is the MSBA has um, has been putting together kind of a task force of designers to look at school reopening and how this all may happen. So and we're part of that, and we are um, that. But that for initial meeting, I believe happened as kind of a kind of a brainstorming session Dawn, was that two days ago it was and Tuesday. then it was today wednesday yeah. it was yesterday it was yesterday and then there's another follow-up meeting which talks much more about how this actually is going to really happen and then they're going i believe they're going to ask they're going to try to put it together a process where districts can engage designers to help them with the reopening and what this all means so this is kind of underway right now. So MSBA so, is thinking about this. So they have not, they previously were not thinking really about it, but I think they, they are at this point considering what this means. So I, to answer your question, I think, yes, there probably will be some, there may be some thought given to the additional costs that you might, but I don't think it'll increase your, it won't, I, I could say 
actually say it will not increase yeah. your your um, the amount of money that they're going to give you, but they may make these things eligible. That is so, possible. Yep. So I'll expand a little bit further, and, and Chad, feel free to jump in and correct me at any point in time. Um, up until this point, I think Easton. Just to start off, Easton's in a great position where we're in design. Uh, I think. Maybe the, for, for this situation, the only better would be if you hadn't even started a project yet, um, but that obviously leads to cost implications for escalation. But um, where we have the capability of getting this into the design and having these value management exercises, we're in a better position. Um, I don't think that anything I've seen or heard from Dan or from this focus group that would be immediately considered ineligible under any of their requirements other than the cost per square foot. Chad, is that accurate? Yeah, that's correct. It's, it's all eligible. The cost per square foot, I can't see going up because I know they have some concerns yep. with cash flow. Yeah. Uh, there is actually a bill right now, I think it's on the floor in the Senate that would uh, inject $5 million into the MSP. And it's really focused at uh, mitigating the additional cost in the construction to do this. Yeah. Yeah, and, temperature screening for the workers and some of the construction. Mm -hmm. yep. And then on the other end of that, the projects that are in construction, I can tell you that the MSBA um, has not, uh, as Dan mentioned, has not offered any additional monies. Uh, what they're doing is asking everyone to track on the construction and any type of changes or costs that are incurred due to COVID. Um, we have the capability of capturing that in our bid. I think one of our last projects, we sent out a memo to uh, our uh, a document with the bid that they noted that the GCs will need to note that they've captured everything in the state guidelines that would re be required on a construction site. So there would be no changes for that for Easton. Um, but uh, they, again, they have not increased any type of that. Um, I was surprised to hear Dan say that there's a task force going on because everything we hear from the MSBA is that they are a funding agency, not a design agency. Um, so I am a little um, <laughs> taken back to hear that, that they, I, I don't think they'll oh, yeah. provide guidelines. What it sounds like is they're going to have a design team that may be separate from them to offer some type of guidelines. Um, and even just for bouncing questions back and forth. Um, they have asked the uh, BSA K-12 yeah. to, to create this round table yeah. and to push this agenda. But Jack McCarthy is pushing it very, very hard and fast. Yep. Yep. Because he's seeing these deadlines that are being imposed upon the districts and he's hearing, I'm sure he's hearing a lot from the districts and he wants to try to help them. So he has, um, we, uh, it's, I, Dawn, I, I was surprised how fast that happened. Yes, it came yesterday. up like, on Monday. It just like popped up yeah. Monday. They were like, this Monday. is happening Tuesday. <laughs> yeah. And then the one Bob's working on setting up with the MSBA, DESE, and a few superintendents who are participating in the conversation is on the 23rd next week we're, we're already engaged with at least one district or one school to help them get this going so i think you're going to see that a lot more i think right now we have the best plan of attack going um with this with this focus group working with um you know the leadership at east end to make sure that these things are thought about making sure we get them into the budget um and obviously with anything that comes out from the MSBA, we'll make sure it gets into this focus group discussion, um, reviewed into the plans and, and costed in the estimates as we're moving along. So I think we're doing the best we can do right now with, with the information that we have. Yeah, but it is happening. So anything else on this focus group uh, discussion and, and kind of where we're moving forward? Keep going. All right. Thank you. Yep, no problem, Kevin. Sure. That discussion was very good. <laughs> All right, Dan, I'll turn it back over to you for the Columbus Ave update. Sure, the last time we talked, we had um, we talked about these improvements to the uh, middle school parking area and how we might envision um, how this might go. And the question that was asked was, can we put numbers to these pieces so that we understand fully what this cost might be because I think that our traffic engineer feels very strongly that we need that we really should consider reorientation of the end of Columbus Ave which is at the north of this drawing here that we really that's something we we, we really need we should think about doing and that he also feels that um, we should re try to consider reconnecting this parking lot to the 
to the um, this road system at the bottom. So the question was asked, can we put some numbers to this and try to understand what this costs? And we decided to break this into three phases. Um, phase one is the uh, connector road going from the site that we're working at, the Parkview site up and connecting the roads to Columbus Ave, which is that through road, which is you know basically the, the major critical piece of the entire design. Um, that's $235,000 in value, and that is included in the base scope. So we, you own that right now, that is going to happen as part of the estimates that you've seen and the costs you've seen already. So that's accounted for. Um, phase two, and I decided to break this into two pieces. Phase two is the reorientation of the um, Columbus, the end of Columbus Avenue to smooth it out and the rework of the parking lot in front of the middle school. Um, this is just a diagrammatic representation. It's not a final a design at all. It's just basically saying this is kind of what we might envision doing if we needed to maintain the number of parking spaces, which I'm positive you want to do, and kind of make this, this whole thing work. Um, there's more work to be done to design this, but just to give you a rough idea, that cost to do that phase two reorientation in part half the parking lot was three hundred and sixteen thousand dollars, and the two well all these costs I added a contingency and um, design and, and management fees too, so that you're getting that that is the, the total cost. Phase three is the bottom of that parking lot, completing it and reconnecting it to the road system, and that's around two hundred and sixty three thousand dollars. So. We're looking at a to do the whole parking lot and you know figure out this one piece of it. You're looking at an ad of about about five hundred and seventy five thousand dollars, almost six hundred thousand dollars to redo these pieces, which were the things that we discussed last time we met about how to complete the park complete a component of the parking and of the uh, parking and traffic issue. Is there so, other um, slide questions on this? No, this is the only slide. The question, the question from the last meeting was, can we throw, can we put prices, yep. accurate pricing to these things? And so, phase one is already going to happen as part of the project. It's in phase the one's going to happen. It's, yep. it's, and it's, it's part of. I'm assuming it's. Is this eligible? Is this piece of work eligible for reimbursement or not? Because is it site work? It's site work, right? It's okay. site work. Okay, that's fine. Yeah. Um. So. I just wanted to make sure I understood or remembered. Um, phase two and phase three, I'm assuming that there is, is there an option that we could take that out of contingency or would the MSBA nix that? I guess what I'm wondering is if there's any way we could put this in the project budget, understanding that it's not reimbursable, but, or is the issue going to be the MSBA is going to look at those two pieces and say, this is not part of that project. I think that's the first thing we need to have a conversation or understand. I can't answer that. I, I can't answer how they're going to view this. Okay. Um, I, my, um, my inclination is to go to the 60% and just like we're doing with the, um, with the classroom thing, we put this on the list of kind of a wish list of things that we want. And we put this on that list and say, these are ads that we, if we have the money and if our, if our estimates come in the way that we hope they do, then these are, then these are things we'd like to put back in the, pro we'd like to put into the project. That's, that's my inclination. I don't think they're, they may not, I mean, Walter, Chad, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but they may not care because we're way over the 8% and they're just going to be like, you're going to pay for it anyway. It doesn't matter to us what you do. I think yeah. we're not cutting scope out of the building. Yeah. Itself, right? So I don't think they're going to care. I think that they, they figure we're going to, yeah, you, it's on you anyway. I, that's what I would do with it. I would put this on our alternate list. Okay. And, and I, I think, think that, want. yep. And I think that the way, I think what we discussed last, um, last meeting was that the way it needs to, and should be, should be, and needs to be portrayed is that it's a safety concern of the district. Yep. Um, 
and that we're not at I think what Dan said was this is not adding parking this is replicating the exact parking that exists today mm -hmm. the number of spaces and it's it's creating a safer or the safest um, uh, roadway entry point for not just east uh, the elementary school that it, we're putting there but all of the schools in general and and alleviating a lot of safety concerns that currently exist and are not being met um, at, at the existing. Chad, I'll let you jump in. I think that's really what we need to do. And I think Dan's suggestion of how we do it is the correct one. I, I agree. I think there's a way that this can be presented to the MSBA that it doesn't become a, a major headache. But first step is making sure that we actually have the funds to execute the work. And that's yeah. we'll have to figure out at the 60% scoping. Agreed. We should make sure we have the money to do it before we engage them. Jane, can I ask a question? Yeah, of course. So if if it turns out, I know I'm what ifing, but if it turns out we don't, we can't make it part of the project, are you saying phase two and phase three can be done in different years even, or even a few years apart from each other, or mm -hmm. they need to be done in pretty quick succession to have that mm -hmm. exit at the bottom? It looks like the, the tie-in right there, Dan, I, I, I don't know if you have the answer to this, but the tie-in at the bottom of the green in phase three, mm -hmm. that maybe could be blocked off with a Jersey barrier and, and left open. I don't know if you want to lose those parking spots I, at that point. I can't say I can't say I have this diagram perfect. Yep. But I tried to break this thing into a into something that was manageable. Yep. So I think, yes, you could do phase two. The only reason you need to mess around with this parking lot is once you rearrange the Columbus out, you can see the, the road underneath it. Once you rearrange the entrance road, it, it basically destroys most of the parking and entrance yeah. to this. So you need to deal with that. But I think you could, there's some line in that phase two block that you could move it to where you could just do that and leave the bottom portion of the lot the way it is until you're ready to do that piece. So they're not, they're not tied together that tightly. Okay, uh, I guess the reason I was asking is if if the town, of course, has to or wants to assume this cost, uh, maybe multi-year projects. Yes. If 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 even possible. However, since phase two looked as though it was getting done before phase three, I was wondering, and this is way premature, but I'm just going to like drop it here, and then you know maybe we talk about it another time if this even becomes a reality. I was wondering from a design standpoint why um, in phase two, that big chunk of land where the flagpole is, isn't somehow included in that. Was it just to minimize the amount of work being done? Because it always, I always wondered why we didn't have handicapped parking right across from the little crosswalk in front of the front no, door. It, it's, it's honestly diagrammatic. I mean, it, it, we once we, if we go, if we're lucky enough to figure to have enough funding to do this, then you know we will refine that design and we could put handicap parking there and move that parking lot, change the. I mean, the most of the cost is going to be involved in that in that parking area. Much less of it's going to be involved in redoing a grass area with some curbing. It's not going to be that much of this cost. So I think would if. If we're able to do phase two, then I would agree that we should encompass this area in the front and rework that where the you know that whole thing because it's not going to we can't just chop half of it off and put a curb there and that's that's all we do we would have to address it. Okay, I, I just again was asking for long term because I. I yeah. I always look at the worst case scenario. So if it can't be included, and then if obviously the town doesn't have the funds for it, it could be talking several, several years. Yes. Whereas if phase two included, you know, even just the handicap parking, at least we'd have that in place and could wait a while for the rest. Um, it was more of a question. Yeah, we could long, totally long do long that. Long sure, yeah, we could do that. And the really the thing was that the phase two is where it is because um, the traffic engineer feels very strongly that that reorientation of Columbus Ave is, is more important than connecting the area below at phase three to the road system. Yeah, because I am, I mean, I love the fact that it's in phases and, and thinking, wow, okay, that could be like a pause button for us and we could just really take many years to get to that when we can. But the top there with the connection to the access road, it does make me nervous in terms of drivers turning there and kids trying to cross that area, buses and, and cars coming in so I can definitely see why 
they felt that phase two should be done first. I mean, as, as, as important yeah. as it is to help ease egress, yeah. that's really, that's right. Um, that's, that's a concern. So I'm glad yep. that, you know, I'm not the only one a little nervous <laughs> about that. I had a question, Jane. Um, I'm, I'm a little bit confused as to um, if phase one is part of the project, um, it, to me, I understand phase two and that, that the area up top is critical um, for, for safety and to make the traffic flow better. What I don't, and, and what I don't understand is why you wouldn't make that connection on phase three anyway down at the bottom is part of the why wouldn't that opening and that connection to the parking lit area um, be included in phase one you lose you would lose too many parking spots to do it lose too many parking spots yeah here. you you lose a lot of parking spots to make that connection at the bottom because of the way the lot works okay. right now so the, the traffic engineer and his suggestion was, or his comment was, if you do this now, you're gonna lose the four, five, six spots that are down there by the connection. Plus yeah. you wanna be able to have the cars rotate through the lot, which is another like four, five, six spots in order to create that through zone, which you do not have. So mm -hmm. we're talking like, you know, 10, between 10 and 12 parking spots lost, plus whatever's lost from the road being put in. So we mm -hmm. felt that was just too much for you to lose in this phase. Could you do it? Yes. It's just, that's, I think we'd have to calculate how many spots you're gonna lose and make sure that's okay before we yeah. go ahead and drive that, that, that thing through that connection. Well, I mean, I, the, as Lisa just pointed out that, that grass area, I wonder if you could, you know, reconfigure this to add those potentially lost spaces down there. You could, but then you would be doing phase one. What's that? I mean, you include could be, those, you could, you included those you could. in phase one, mm -hmm. along with the connection here. Oh, I see. So would that work? Or I don't, that I don't know. Up top? Or that I don't know. We haven't looked at putting any kind of other parking off of the, this connector road. Yeah, no, I understand. I just thought it might be worth looking at. Right. I mean, I think my suggestion would be to get to the get through the six get to the sixty percent estimate, see where we're at, and see where yeah. if we can, if any of these things can be afforded, and if we find that we can afford phase two, then maybe we use them. We're going to go into a design on that and see if we can accommodate these things, and maybe that connection does happen. Yeah, I hear you. I have a, I have a remind Thank me you. of a money question. Someone needs to remind me of money, and and so I'm going to go back. I'm rewinding the clock to like feasibility um, where, you know, it was that million dollars that the town had set aside for feasibility that we used to pay, to pay for feasibility and schematic and that we subsequently were reimbursed at the 52 point whatever percent for that piece of the work that was done. Did we allocate, and I know we had this conversation and I can't remember how it ended up. Do you take that reimbursement allocation and apply it into the main project budget, or did we not do that? Do you remember having those conversations? I guess what I'm asking is that if money ends up being an issue, is there a possibility that we could have a conversation and, and, and it's not something school planning can decide, but this would probably be a conversation that would need to happen with, um, you know, between the town and school planning or somehow is there's that reimbursement money that's there unless we've already applied it to something. And I can't remember what we decided to do. I believe it was actually applied towards the borrowing scenarios. Okay, I could, I, that's what I could not remember. That I couldn't remember that, but we can look at that as a possibility. Yep. Connor, do you remember if it was applied to the borrowing scenario? I don't remember. I don't. Um, I know that that was a question that some voters had. 
um, because that's one of those things that's on its face makes sense. If you're reimbursed for a small piece of it, you should apply it to the debt, but it's also um, given the scale of the debt payments, it would be so marginal that I don't know if that's something we would have done. Um, I can check with Wendy. If, okay. if it, um, you know, and, and again, just speaking about finances in general with this, we're talking a $600,000 capital item. I think the first priority, and it sounds like this is what people are already saying, is to try to make the case that this is a necessary piece of this project to maintain safe access and egress to the site, yep. and provided it fits within the project budget, whether it's a reimbursable cost or not, we know it's not, it's site work. Being able to do so within the scale, the scope of the budget and get it done with the borrowing authorization we have is obviously the number one priority. Alternatively, if you're going to do 600,000 out of capital, even if we were to get uh, 520,000 and change or whatever that reimbursement payment would be for uh, feasibility, under normal circumstances, you would not do, or we wouldn't with our financial portfolio, do a $600,000 capital item with cash. Um, we would borrow for that yeah. and probably be better serve sticking 600 grand in the capital stabilization fund. Mm -hmm. um, there's a variety of options there. Okay. Um, I'll check. We've probably already been reimbursed. I'm guessing we've already been, been that was, you know, I'm, I'm assuming that that reimbursement has already happened because that was from feasibility and schematic. So um, yep. I think the question is, did we apply it to the project or not? And I don't remember. I know we had the discussion, but I just didn't remember. Yeah, I'll check. I'll send something out now and ask Thanks. for clarity. Thanks. And fingers crossed that the estimates come back <laughs> and allow this to happen within the scope of, you know, within our budget. That would be the prefer, you know, I think that's everybody's hope. Absolutely. And Perkins Eastman, I think, has already reached out to their estimators to make sure that we have, obviously, these are the numbers that they have for this proposal, but we'll make sure that this yeah. isn't value management discussion that we have uh, with this committee. Yeah, these were these were developed by the estimators. Yep. Hey, Jane, uh, one one quick point. Um, I know that we have two votes at the, at the bottom of the meeting. Uh, Jamie and I also have a conflicting overlapping FinCom meeting that's coming up uh, at seven. Is that something that we can jump ahead to or do we have enough people for quorum if we take off? I, th I think I can get through the next couple of slides and we can be there in less than five minutes unless you need to go right now. Hit it. All right. I'm leaving you. <laughs> All right. Uh, just a quick schedule slide update. Uh, this has not changed. Um, obviously, we'll keep working to all of these dates. Uh, again, a uh, quick schedule update or uh, design phase milestone update, uh, working towards that August 14th submission to the MSBA. Um, next important uh, couple meetings internal to PMA and Perkins are the August 3rd estimate reconciliation. And then obviously the August 5th SBC value management where we're gonna discuss all of these items. Uh, this is, again, just a high-level, high 60% uh, CD phase work plan. Uh, we've hit all our dates, had all these meetings um, moving forward, um, and have that August 5th placeholder meeting, and, um, and PMA will reach out a week prior, or uh, a couple days prior to let you know if we need that one to value management down. Otherwise, we can work off of that August 12th meeting. Quick. Budget update, uh, billed to date is the 2.94 million, uh, MSBA reimbursement to date 1.609. Uh, yes, Jane, we have been, uh, Easton has been reimbursed for a feasibility study. Um, Easton's la latest pro pay is for um, every, in all the invoices through May of 2020. Uh, new business was next meeting, uh, these, uh, I don't have slides for these items, so they're the two um, proposals uh, from the geotech engineer and from the uh, wastewater treatment plant engineer. Um, the geotech engineer, uh, I believe it's about $9,800, Dan. That sounds right. I can, I can look I'm up gonna, the exact I'm, 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 I'll look I'm up gonna, the exact amount. Perfect. Thank you. Um, and Dan, if you would, while you're doing that, if you wouldn't mind giving me a quick description of it, um, just these, these funds are already in Perkins Eastman's uh, authorized in their contract. So it wouldn't be a um, amendment to their contract. It would just be authorization from this committee to expend funds. This is specific to the geotech portion. So I'll let Dan jump. Not, it's not uh, 9,982. 
Is that what yeah, I'm looking that's at? That's correct. Yeah. 998250. Yeah. We um yeah, we we have a feasibility study level geotechnical report that has been very has been perfectly sufficient for designing the project. Um, the structural engineer and you know everyone's in agreement that that we should go ahead and finalize this into a design report and which is a little bit more information, some more borings. Um, I listed the scope here. There's four supplemental borings that are needed. Um, geo, there's a geotechnical engineering and report that needs to be done. And it really just fills in all any other gaps that are might be missing from the previous report and finalizes that. So it's an official complete design report for the geotechnical aspects of the project. Um, we think it's a really, it's a good thing to do. When, as Walter mentioned, we do have um, in the already in the fee, this is built in. So we're just asking to to kind of authorize it for you guys to authorize us to bill against this piece to roughly ten thousand dollars, nine thousand nine hundred eighty-two and fifty cents. Okay. Is there any discussion or questions that we need to have before I ask for a motion to approve this? Anybody have questions, comments, discussion? So may I please have a motion to authorize PE to bill the amount of 9,982.50 for the additional um, geotechnical work. Is that a clear enough motion for you guys? Works for me. Okay. Ellen, so moved. O'Neill, second. Okay, so Cabral. I'm, I'm doing a roll call. Yeah, roll call vote. Carlson? Yes. Fulginetti? Yes. Helen? Yes. O'Neill? Yes. Reed? Yes. Sobrai? Yes. Stebbins? Yes. Weintraub? Yes. Wiseman? Yes. Martin? Yes. Okay, next is the wastewater pre treatment plan. Yep. And, um, so I didn't get to send this out to the committee. Uh, this piece is uh, that we do not have uh, funds for this authorized in the contract already. However, we do have a, uh, a piece of design fund in the budget. Uh, I believe that we would bill this against. Um, so Jess, sorry, Which, I'll let you. That's what you guys mentioned. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, we did get a proposal to do the wastewater treatment upgrades. And one of the things that they need to do is not only design work, but they need to do a hydrological assessment report. And they'll need to go back to the state and make sure that we can permit it properly and get that work done as well. Um, because we are increasing the design flow from 26,000 to 31,000 GPD. Um, there's a lengthy um, proposal that they put together for it, there's three different components of it. The first one is the design component. The second one is the hydrological assessment, which I believe is coupled with the design component. I think we need to do those things together. And then the third one is the construction administration, which is where they basically take on the administration of the contract with whoever we end up hiring to do this. One thing that I think we do need to talk about is how this gets done. Um, whether or not this gets done as its own separate project, which I think that's what they're anticipating, or whether or not this goes under our general contractor. Um, I would suggest it gets done as a separate project on its own, um, because I think that we can get this done in the summer before we, or if, as we're constructing the other building and let um, Stantec be the lead and do the construction administration and, and basically deal with this project on their own and not have it become a second fiddle to the primary building project, which I think is a, very, is, a, is a valid fear that I think we all should have, is that this becomes something secondary to the main project and doesn't get done correctly. Um, but this so, is still happening from the budget of the project. Yes, we already have this construction component in the budget right. of the project, that is correct, right. yes. So it will still be happening. It would just be basically a separate project that we're bidding out. So this is within the EES project budget and yes. borrowing authorization. It wouldn't have been reimbursable anyway because it's not for the school structure. It's necessary yep. work to support the school structure. 
what we're talking about right now is hydro hydrological testing that is necessary to get a grip on what the actual construction would look like. The funding exists right now for that testing. You don't need to amend your design contract. So if that's what you're asking for approval for tonight. I do need to amend my design contract because you guys have in your budget, I think it's four hundred and fifty thousand dollars for additional potential design. Yes. So this is this has to be you have to access the four hundred and fifty thousand and shift the hundred and ninety-eight over to us in order to have us engage Stantec okay. to so, do this work. Or so, you can do it yourself. That's that I mentioned to the, these guys, the two, Chad and Walter as well. And I'm, I'm I'm perfectly fine if the district decides to do it themselves as well and you so, guys hire it and do it. So when you sh say shift over, maybe Connor, you were just getting ready to ask this, I'm sorry. Are you saying that from the $450,000 line item, we're shifting over yes. 198? And Correct. So, so that leaves, will that leave enough? Was that the line item that we were doing? I can't remember what was in that line item. That's not where the construction work is coming from, right? This is still just the design contingency that I'm talking about right now. No, nope, right? not that not design contingency. Okay. <laughs> nope. Not and not design contingency. This is this, is this this was this is the exact type of work that this money was included in the mm -hmm. budget for. Okay. It's a budget contingency. It was a budget number. Okay. Yeah. For unknown design work that might need to be happen. In order to support the project and this is an unknown thing that we none of us knew we needed to do and and the cost for this is one hundred and ninety eight thousand dollars because that's not in this little e I, I didn't see that number i didn't see that number anyway where it's one hundred. Yeah, the cost is one hundred ninety eight thousand i, I have yeah. sorry to do the design the hydrological assessment and the construction administration so that's hiring stantec to do the full project to start okay. design right away permit it properly, get it all done, and then go all the way through construction and give you your as built at the end of the job. And then that would leave 450, 350, like 250 in that line item and you're comfortable with that amount being left in that line item? Is that? Yeah, we have the proposal. I so. uh, yeah, I don't think there would yeah. be anything wrong with it. It's, I, I think at 60% CDs, if we haven't uncovered anything else like this, I, okay. I don't think that's unreasonable. Connor, I'm sorry, you had questions. Yeah, so to be clear then, what the order of events here then would be that uh, Parkinson's Eastman, you're gonna submit, uh, Walter, you just said you have a proposal. So you as OPM are gonna vet that proposal, send it to my office for us to bring forward to the select board for yes. them and the town's contract with Parkins for this. Exactly, set. yep, following a, following a recommendation by the school planning committee, yep. Okay, yes. and then just to make sure I understand, so this is for the, through uh, contract administration and then the actual construction uh, work associated with the wastewater treatment plant would be managed as a separate, much smaller project, but it would still, would the construction cost be borne out of mm -hmm. the EES project budget and would uh, PMA function as the OPM for that? Yep, we will support that project. It'll be funded through the construction line items there, so. Um, I, I would you recommend have an on the, the construction costs and that this is within the construction budget and or contingency to a degree right. you're comfortable with. If we carried it as part of the uh, DDP's scoping exercise. We, we included the construction costs themselves. Okay. Those are now in the scope. Okay. Uh, I, I, I would prefer Perkins contract um, because we've already gone through the designer solicitation and there's no guarantee you get Stantec if, if we put this back out and put it through a, uh, a full chapter seven. I have no concerns with amending Perkins existing contract. Any other questions or discussion? Is everybody clear on what we're being asked to do before I ask for the motion? So I'm going to go ahead, Walter, correct me if I get this wrong. So I'm asking for a motion to um, authorize the school for the school planning committee to authorize a change to Perkins contract through the that will be presented to the board of selectmen or the select board um, in the amount of $198,000. Is that what I'm at? Is that, the, is that the exact number, Dan? Yes, it is. Okay. Yep. 
um, as design costs for geotechnical work relate, no, as design costs related to the wastewater treatment plant. Exactly. Okay. Right. Can I have a motion? So moved, O'Neill. Second. Second, Carlson. Cabral. Cabral, yes. Carlson. Yes. Fulginetti. Yes. Helen. Yes. O'Neill. Yes. Reed. Yes. Soberai. Yes. Stebbins. Yes. Weintraub. Yes. Wiseman. Yes. And Martin. Yes. So, Patrick and Jamie, you're you're good to go. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Bye bye. Um, okay. Walter and Dan, just so you know, we need whatever materials those are uh, that you have at least one week in advance of any select boards meeting. The next meeting's the 27th, the one after that's August 10th. So if you wanna be on the dance card for the 27th, we need that uh, those materials uh, first thing Monday morning. You got it. Perfect. So next meeting, go ahead, Walter. Uh, next meeting, I believe is our tentative meeting for August 5th mm -hmm. uh, and that is uh, a uh, tentative because if, if we have design uh, budget issues based off of our reconciliation meeting, um, PMA and Perkins will be in touch with um, Jane, Leisha, everyone, and let you know if that meeting is necessary. If not, the next meeting that would be canceled, and the next meeting would be uh, the August 12th meeting. Okay. And I'm assuming that we have no idea yet, but just given the discussions that we've had tonight about a couple of items, I'd really encourage people to plan that the fifth is is liable to need to happen. It didn't ha need to happen last time, but. Well, uh, I don't think we're, we're not, um, mm -hmm. I don't think we're including a lot of new items. What we're doing okay. is costing out those options. So the, the budget could very well come in, but those items, if, if they're they desired. may not be able to fit them. Right, right. Yeah. so that discussion would happen August 12th anyway. 12th. It would only yeah. be if we need to cut a significant scope um, okay. to have that August 5th, so. Okay, good. Yeah. Fingers crossed. <laughs> okay. um, any other business or anything else anybody has questions or comments on tonight? Jane, this, yep. is, this is Florence and Michael Sullivan. Yep. And uh, uh, Dan, I'd like to talk to Dan. We sent a, an email to Dan and you uh, last week. On yep. The, yep. Okay. And I, I wondered uh, if you were going to be responding to us as to the yep. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Absolutely. So, I apologize. Right. I haven't gotten back to it right now, Florence. Well, I can tell you were very busy because I, mean, <laughs> I heard the whole meeting. So <laughs> I well, know what's going on. But we and, just want to be uh, maybe a little reassured about what's going to happen about the uh, road next next yeah. year. And I, I can tell you we haven't changed any of the design based on what we found. So there's nothing different. There's nothing that's been changed. From before. Yeah, yes, but it's hard for us to actually see on the design yep. exactly where the road will be um, in relation to where it is now. Sure. You know, okay. well, yep. like the width of the road. Um, I know there are some dimensions that you gave me about 20 feet. The uh, well, ball field is 20 feet from Spooner Street, or 30 feet from Spooner, 20 Street, 20 feet from somewhere else on the, the access road. But it's very difficult to know where you're measuring, where the beginning of the 20 feet or the 30 feet is, as opposed to seeing it like laid out or described to you. Do you understand? Yep. Yeah. So what I what I, the the next thing I could do, again, if you can give me a few days to do it, is to get the actual graphic from the um, the work they just did. Yes. Which is when they pinned out the property lines, mm -hmm. and then overlay that on what we've already designed and send that to you, so you can see. That would be great. That would be I, great. I don't know how those two things kind of go together yet. I yeah. my my thought is they that I don't think we're gonna. My initial thought is I don't think we'll have an issue, but let me let me make sure. Okay. okay. Well, I thank you. I appreciate that. Sure. Thanks, Florence, and thanks for your patience. Thank you. Thanks. You're welcome. Okay. So with that, um, could I have a motion to adjourn? So moved, O'Neill. <laughs> second. We're all second. And I'll do a quick roll call vote. Cabral? Yes. Carlson? Yes. Fulginetti? Yes. Helen? Oh, he's gone. Sorry. O'Neill? 
Yes. Reed? Yes. Sober Eye? Yes. Weintraub? Yes. Weissman? Yes. And Martin, yes. And with that, um, thank you for everybody joining us tonight. And we will see you at the beginning of August. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Bye.